name's Kathy Meyer. I am co-chair of the depot with Linda Hackbarth, who is off getting more chairs right now. Uh, and uh, I uh, want to introduce Martha Mullen to you. I know many of you already know her. Uh, she is the author of Reflections on the Road, a journey through Whitman County past and present. And she'll be speaking on chapter six mostly tonight, which is her chapter on the railroads, <laughs> how they affected life in the past and continue to affect life in Huntman County today. Uh, oh. Marty has, uh, she is retired from WSU in 2003. She worked at uh, the Student Union Building for many years. Uh, she was an advisor to student government groups and uh, worked with BPLAC, the Visual and Performing Arts uh, group at WSU, uh, that bring you all those wonderful programs up there. Um, and starting in about 2004 or 2005, uh, she came up with this brilliant idea to drive on every single road in Whitman County. County roads. County, county, roads. county roads. County roads. Well, you probably had to drive on some of the others to get to those county roads, I'm guessing. <laughs> anyway, um, and she wrote a book about her experiences. How many of you already have her book and have read it? <laughs> oh, we have fans! <laughs> yes! You that paid is... for one of my trips. Excellent! <laughs> Excellent. Well, if you brought the book, Marty will be available after her talk to autograph them if she hasn't already. Anyway, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. And without further ado, here's Martha Mullen. Well, you may wonder why I'm uh, starting a talk on Whitman County Roads with an image, uh, or railroads with, with an image that definitely is not a local one. Uh, colonial Spanish architecture was never big in the Palouse. Uh, I'm starting with this. This is from my hometown in, in Quanah, Texas, Hardeman County. And uh, this is the QANP Railroad. It was a part of the um, uh, Santa Fe line. And I'm starting with it for, for several reasons. One, I think uh, the QANP kind of exemplifies the vision of the early uh, road builders, and especially, uh, maybe one could even say over ambition of them, because the Q stand, stood for Quana, obviously. The A stood for Acme, a little town about five miles outside of Quana, and the P stands for the Pacific. <laughs> and um, to my knowledge, the QANP only made it as far as Floydata. Texas, about 950 miles short of the Pacific, but it never hurts to dream big. Uh, another reason I wanted to include it is that this beautiful building was under threat of demolition uh, for a number of years until the local historical society bought it and made it a, into the Quantum Museum. So I think we ought to give a round of applause for historical societies that save old people. <laughs> But the, the main reason is because of a story my dad told me, uh, probably apocryphal, but uh, those are some of the best kind. But I, it, that demonstrates how important railroads can be to small communities. Uh, back in the 1880s, when Texas was finalizing the county lines and try, trying to determine um, county seats, Quanah was one of several small communities in Hardeman County vying for the uh, to be the county seat, and the powers that be in, in Texas decided that they would put it up to a vote of the county residents, which I think is, sounds rather democratic. However, uh, the way that one proved that you were a resident of the county was to show that you had had your laundry done in the, in the county for uh, at least a month, and of course that <laughs> cleverly disenfranchised anybody they didn't want to vote, those who were too poor to have someone else you know, do their laundry. But it turns out the uh, uh, town fathers of Quana were even more clever because they approached the crews on the railroad that came through and offered them free laundry service. <laughs> and they could drop off their laundry as it came through and then they could you know, pick it up on the way back. And many of them took one up on that. Uh, 
they became temporary residents, and when the vote was cast, they voted for Quanah, and it became the county seat. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, in Whitman County, uh, becoming a county seat was not an issue. Colfax pretty much was de facto county seat from the time it was incorporated. But I'd like to share with you um, a, a quote from uh, uh, Donald Minnig, who wrote uh, Environment and Settlement in the Palouse, 1868 through 1910. All towns had a fairly equal chance of becoming an important trade center. All were surrounded by rich farmland. All were interconnected with wagon roads and all undoubtedly had enthusiastic citizens behind them. But the railroad changed this equality, for in the pre-motor era, it drew all traffic irresistibly to its lines and was capable of completely reorienting an entire region with the slightest penetration. Not only did all grain flow to it, but it became the avenue of immigrant entrance and of the importation of all necessities sold in village stores. Thus, the securing of a rail line was truly a life and death matter for any budding community, and the energies of all inhabitants were directed toward inducing the railroad to thread its line through their communities. Uh, a more personalized uh, description of the same impact is in a, a book called Hills of Home, which was it's a collection of essays by J.B. West, who was a longtime grocer in Palouse, and also his son, who, who pulled the essays together with some of his own. And it's a wonderful little book uh, if you're interested in, in anything about Palouse, history of Palouse. But J.B. West um, talked about how Palouse really almost didn't, isn't the Palouse we know today. The city which is the way he described it, and mainly because it was called Palouse City to distinguish it from the river and the surrounding territory. But the city itself was little more than a shanty town of about 300 people, which had existed for 14 years in the hope that a railroad would come through. <laughs> had the village been bypassed, as almost happened, it would have ceased to exist within a few years. Evidently, the Northern Pacific had uh, so had a preliminary plan to build a railroad down through, that would uh, come through Palouse. It was going to be part of their, what they call the Spokane to Palouse line. And, uh, but the head of the newspaper, editor of the newspaper in Palouse, happened to own some property a little west of Palouse, and he tried to convince the railroad to change their plans and direct the line through his property. Uh, fortunately for Palouse, there was a banker up in Spokane, Mr. Cannon, who went to New York City, not a simple trip in those days, and talked to the uh, head of the uh, Northern Pacific and convinced them to stick with their original plans, their original line, and so Palouse was saved. But I think before we uh, look down on that editor as being, you know, uh, more interested, being greedy and interested in his own profit, we have to keep in mind that Mr. Cannon also had interest in Palouse and became a banker there. So, but uh, what then were these railroads, these first, the first railroads in Whitman County that were so important? And um, Donald Minnick says that there were really two waves of railroad building. One was from about um, 1800, I mean uh, 1880 to 1905, and the second wave was after that. And in the first wave, there were really two players there was the Northern Pacific, which I just mentioned, but there was also uh, the Oregon uh, Railroad Navigation Company, which was a subsidiary of the Union Pacific. And the two relationships was, uh, their, their relationship was really one mainly of competition, even though there was a brief period of cooperation and even consolidation in, in the early um, 1880s. But the, uh, it was the Oregon Navigation and Railroad Company that came, made the first, uh, came to Whitman County first because they sent surveyors of, uh, to what was Texas Ferry down on the uh, Snake River, what today is called as Riparia. And they sent a survey crew there to plot a line uh, that drove from Riparia up to Colfax. Um, 
They also, while they wanted to have the responsibility for building that line, they also granted the Northern Pacific the right to build all of the railroads in the rest of the county. How they could do that, I, I, I don't quite understand. But anyway, and I had said that that was the case. Uh, during the period of the very short period of time, about two years, that the two uh, railroads consolidated, the decision was made uh, not to build a railroad line to Texas Ferry, but to come into the county further to the west um, in Franklin County, um, Connell, what is now Connell, because there was a, a, a Northern Pacific main line that went through there, and they were bringing it in, coming in through La Crosse, and basically followed the course of, of what is Rebel Flat Creek. I don't know if you all know that. Maybe I should explain. These little fish things for my friend who did the map for me, those are bodies of uh, uh, rivers. This is the Snake, this is Union Black Creek, and this is um, uh, Pope And But Rebel Creek, uh, Flat Creek, was along about basically the line. Here's Winona and, and Endicott, and they brought in uh, the line that way. And it was completed in, in uh, 1883, so it was a very short period of time that it took to build that line. And as I say, at that point, the uh, two railroads uh, split and it became uh, more competition and it's very complicated and I'm not going to bore you with any more dates from that early period except for 1888 because that was the year that the line came down from Spokane into Palouse, the line that saved Palouse. In, in the second wave of railroad building, there were three uh, railroads that were important or that uh, came into existence. <clears throat> the first was the Washington, Idaho, and Montana, and it really came into existence because of the growing uh, 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 lumber industry in northern Idaho, and specifically with the creation of the Potlatch Corporation in, in 1903 under a, a William Deary as manager. And he had originally intended floating logs from Potlatch down the Palouse River to a sawmill in uh, Palouse. That was his idea. But he soon discovered it would be impossible to, uh, that river could not handle the flow that he intended. So he decided he needed a railroad and he um, couldn't interest either the Union Pacific or the Northern Pacific, so the Potlatch Corporation built their own. And I forgot to show some slides, I, I got carried away, but let me, uh, back in that first period of railroad building, let me just show you a, a couple of slides. This is the um, Oregon and Railroad, uh, the ORN Depot in La Crosse. This is the uh, line that came down in uh, Northern Pacific into Palouse. The, uh, and this is um, a, a Union Pacific roundhouse up in Tico, uh, and this was with around 1906, 7, um, and so it shows that the ORN and Union Pacific reneged on their decision to let the Northern Pacific build all the railroads in the northern part of the county. Um, I don't have any historical photos of the uh, uh, Washington, Idaho, and Montana, but I do have a couple of pictures that show where the track was and actually still exists today. This is the uh, old railroad bridge at what is called, um, here I go, help me, uh, Kennedy Ford. <laughs> Kennedy Ford. Um, and that's just pretty much at the conjunction of Highway 6 and 95. Um, and this is a, a closer to Palouse, about a mile outside of Palouse. The picture was taken from North Palouse, North River Road, and you can see the tracks and that they followed very closely along the Palouse. The second railroad line that I want to talk about was the Spokane and Inland Empire. And it was part of a kind of nationwide movement to take the concept of electric lines that existed in uh, urban areas and use that concept and extend those lines out to connect cities with their surrounding communities. Um, and the, the uh, Spokane Inland Empire was, the company was founded in 1906 and while they had a number of plans as you can see, they two, 
two of the lines especially impacted uh, Whitman County. They plant a vein line down from Spokane down into Palouse and then a branch line that would cut off at Rosalia and come into Colfax. And this branch line was um, completed by, I think, 1907, and this line, uh, the main line, by 1908. And this line was really a very appropriate, or the electric concept was pretty appropriate for the Palouse uh, and also benefited it. The one reason it was appropriate as the uh, electric engines were much lighter than steam engines, and so it was cheaper uh, and easier to build track. And that especially was helpful with the track uh, in the Palouse Hills. But the reason it was such a boon to the uh, people of Whitman County was that they not only carried passengers and, and made frequent stops at places in, in the county, but they also had um, a less than full capacity boxcars so farmers could send their milk and eggs and perishable uh, products, could send them, distribute them with, uh, throughout the county for sale. The, the third player, and uh, in some ways the, the biggest, was the uh, Milwaukee, uh, the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul. Uh, it eventually became known as just the Milwaukee, and I'm gonna just refer to it as that because the other's kind of a mouthful. But it was one of a number of, of lines that were created, or uh, railroads built up in the upper Midwest uh, called Granger Railroads. And what they did is they connected the mid upper Midwest farmers with the markets in the bigger cities of the area like Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul. <laughs> but um, if those lines decided to expand, uh, they had a couple of options. They could uh, contact and negotiate with some of the existing transcontinental lines to use their tracks or they could build their own. And in 1905, the Milwaukee made two really momentous decisions for Whitman County. First of all, they decided to build their own line, but second, they decided to bring that line not through Spokane, uh, west through Spokane, which you might have expected, but because they wanted the most direct and cheapest route, so they decided to bring it through Upper Whitman County. And it came down through St. Mary's, uh, Avery and St. Mary's, <coughs> in Idaho uh, through Chico, or maybe I should say over Chico because Union Pacific already had a rail, uh, a rail yard there, so they built a trestle over Chico. Uh, came down and picked up uh, uh, Pine Creek and followed it, basically. Uh, Rosalia went back up briefly into Spokane County, down through what is now Baldwin, uh, and then over down the east side of, of Rock Lake, and then eventually uh, west out of the county. And I say what uh, is now Malden because the, the Milwaukee really created the town of Malden. They couldn't, they, they needed some place to, in Whitman County, to uh, be able to change crews and, and trains, but uh, since Tico was out of the question, they decided that they would uh, make Malden, uh, that area where Malden is, uh, would be their uh, route, they would have their roundhouse and a crew change station there. And this was laying tracks in about 1808, uh, I mean 1908, because the line through Whitman County was uh, completed by 1909. And you can see the uh, tents of the railroad workers. Uh, this photo is from 1909, just shortly after the line was completed. And you can see a town is emerging and they even have their own post office at this point. And then this is two years <coughs> later, there's a depot and the trains are coming through and you can see houses on the other side. So anyway, uh, but obviously it's one of those cases what the railroads give, the railroads sometimes take away and, and the mold and uh, it, it's about that size or less as that second picture now, but anyway. And I'll come back and talk a little bit more about, uh, especially about the Milwaukee uh, as, as we go on. But I'd like to turn now and look specifically at some of the, the impacts, other than the fact that you know the railroad saved Palouse and created Malden. Uh, but what were some of the other impacts? And one of them was a fairly minor one, uh, but I, I'm just gonna say, uh, call it a place names in Whitman County. 
and just a very good resource if you're ever interested in how towns got their name. Uh, Edith Erickson's book is just delightful. Uh, Whitman County from Abbeville to Zion and their schools and, and sidings and towns and, and places uh, all mentioned and she many times tells how they came about getting their name. Uh, Abbeville, as I was telling Diane, uh, nobody knows where Abbeville was because it was just a, a name on an application for a post office and they didn't say where uh, and probably that's why it was denied their application but uh, and Zion is a little Lutheran uh, cemetery pioneer cemetery north of Endicott it is not a Duke basketball player I've got in my March Madness records I don't have to do it anymore but, uh, but anyway, there were some towns that were specifically named by personnel of the railroad lines. And there were three in particular, uh, Malden, Pandora, and Revere got their names uh, from the vi uh, vice president of the Milwaukee. And uh, it's known that uh, Malden was named after Malden, Massachusetts. Uh, perhaps the vice president had family there, had some contacts. No one really knows why he named this small siding that's east of Rosea Pandora. My opinion is he was probably having a bad day at the office. <laughs> but, uh, but then there was Revere, and why name a spot out in the western part of the county after a Revolutionary War hero? And the only thing that uh, Edith Erickson suggests that perhaps it was because before the railroads came in, the mail had to be delivered in that part of the county by horse. So, uh, but my favorite story uh, of how a, a town got its name, probably indirectly uh, from the railroad, uh, is the town of Chico. It was originally called uh, Fork of the Creek uh, after Hangman Creek, and the uh, rather infamous Hangman Creek, because that's where the Chal uh, Hual Chan, who was one of the uh, Yakima uh, uh, chiefs, was captured and, and hung there. Uh, and uh, But later years, in the 1880s, Tico decided they wanted to apply for a post office and needed uh, something a little more official sounding than, than Fark of the Creek. And it was supposedly then, it was when the wife of a uh, the sawmill owner suggested Chico, which was a Hebrew term meaning city of tents. And we're assuming it's because there were so many railroad workers in the area living in temporary housing in tents, uh, uh, building the, that Union Pacific uh, yard. There's an, another um, impact that probably is a stretch, but I think it can be argued that the railroads, or at least a railroad, was responsible for one of the more intriguing grade markers in Whitman County. And one day I was out in Palouse uh, at Greenwood Cemetery wandering around and I saw this great marker for Burville Brown who as you can see died in uh, 1913 at the age of 24. But what really intrigued me is across the bottom of the stone it says that he was a victim of corporation greed <laughs> and you know why I, I was i was very curious so i immediately went to the uh, local uh, funeral home and they didn't know and i asked bob west who had become by then my source of all information for loose and he wasn't sure and i was trying to decide where i might find out when just a chance con conversation with nick keesley he was telling me his wife, uh, Karen, had um, found this really interesting grave <coughs> marker out in, in Palouse, and I realized we were talking about the same one. But Karen, being a woman, a uh, uh, very smart woman, thought immediately to go to the newspaper museum in Palouse, which is also run by the Historical Society, and she looked up microfilm of the, the papers from uh, 1913 and found a, a notice of Bert uh, Brown's de death, but it, the heading said, Palouse boy killed in Northern Pacific rail yards in Spokane. Mm -hmm. And uh, so clearly there was a connection 
why the family chose to have him immortalized in this way, I, I don't know. Perhaps they felt the, the railroad was more interested in profit than safety, but uh, which would not be necessarily a, a wrong guess. But, uh, but let's turn now to really some of the more major impacts. And if you'll remember that uh, quote earlier from uh, Donald Vinnick, he talked about how the railroads were the avenues of immigrant entrance into the county. And um, I, when I was out talking with people in the county and asking them, how did your family happen to get here? A term that came up uh, several times was immigrant train. And I had never heard, what, didn't know what an immigrant train was. Uh, so I decided I would do some serious research like Karen. So I, I Googled it. Um, <laughs> and found out that in the late 19th century, early 20th century, many of the main railroad lines had uh, offered less than, uh, you know, relatively less expensive, shall we say, fares, one-way fares for people who wanted to come from the eastern part of the U.S. out to the west. And many of them even, or some of them even, had ties with us ocean steamer companies so that someone could come from Great Britain or the continent on an immigrant boat to the East Coast port and then get on an immigrant train and, and come west. And we're very fortunate to have a first-hand account of what it was like to ride an, an immigrant train because the young Scottish writer uh, Robert Louis Stevenson um, who, who was both a novelist and a travel writer, uh, happened to fall in love with an American woman named Fanny Osborne. And he wanted, when she decided to come back to the uh, States, to her home in California, he wanted to follow her, but couldn't afford it on his own. And his parents wouldn't help him because they didn't approve of her. She was 10 years older and also married at the time. <laughs> but uh, he managed to pull together uh, enough from his own uh, earnings to come by the immigrant route. And being Robert Louis Stevenson, he wrote about it and wrote a couple of essays, uh, one the amateur immigrant and the other across the plains. And I thought I would just read you a, a brief ex uh, excerpt from his book, Across the Plains, so you get a feel of what it was like. Those of you sitting on that bench will really relate to this. <laughs> It was about two in the afternoon of Friday that I found myself in front of the immigrant house with more than a hundred others to be sorted and boxed for the journey. A white-haired official with a stick under one arm and a list in the other hand, hand stood apart in front of us and called name after name in a tone of command. At each vein you would see a family gather up its brats and bundles and run for the hindmost of the three cars awaiting us and I so, soon concluded that this was to be set apart for women and children. The second or central car, it turned out, was devoted to men traveling alone and the third to the Chinese. And then he goes on to say, I suppose the reader has some notion of an American railroad car, that long, narrow wooden box like a flat roof Noah's Ark with a stove at one end and a convenience at the other, a passage down the middle and transverse ditches on either hand. Those destined for immigrants on the Union Pacific were only remarkable for their extreme, extreme plainness, plainness, nothing but wood entering in any part of their constitution, and for the usual inefficiency of the lamps, which often went out and shed but a dying glimmer even when they burned. The benches are too short for anything but a young child, where there is scarce elbow room for two to sit, there will not be space enough for one to lie. Um, I, and for the romantics in the room, let me just say that Robert Louis Stevenson did get to California. Uh -huh. Fanny divorced her husband and they married and by all accounts were happily married for the 10 years, remaining years of his life. He died a very untimely early, uh, at early age. But for those coming to Whitman County, uh, before 1883, there was no, you know, the Im no immigrant trains came here, so they usually had to add tack on additional journeys, uh, maybe riverboat up the Palouse, or coming overland by wagon or cart. 
Um, this is a couple who, uh, early settlers in Whitman County, uh, Daniel and Amelia Boone. Uh, Kathy is their great, great, great granddaughter-in-law, and because she's a, a professional historian, she has become the keeper of the family's history and stories, and so was able to share uh, with me uh, about them. Daniel came first to Whitman County in, in 1877, and uh, to join his sister, who was down in the Union Flat area, uh, north of Wawaii. And uh, so he must have come, you know, have additional ways, uh, in addition to coming just on a train. But he went back to Illinois in 1888 and married Amelia, and the two of them, plus his brother and uh, sister-in-law, came back to Whitman County uh, by train. Uh, as Kathy pointed out to me that even though it was pretty arduous uh, trip, that for many it was the only, really only option that they had. They couldn't afford any other fare or to come perhaps by earlier by a wagon train. But she also mentioned that for some, a hard bench would have been a luxury because they ended up coming in boxcars along with their, with their animals. And again, I, I thought of a story uh, that uh, J.B. West has included in his book where he talks about the Comstock family from Minnesota who came uh, to the Palouse. And uh, the family came later by a passenger car, but Mr. Comstock, had stalls with mangers were built into one railroad box car for the family's four cows, horses, and cows. The father had to accompany the car to feed and water the stock and milk the one fresh cow, but he could spend most of his time in the caboose with the crew. But my favorite part about the story is that J.B. West talks about how railroads were the modern day wagon trains. Of course, what modern day as in 1902. Um, the next impact I want to talk about, uh, uh, it's best described, I think, as the impact of the railroads on the built environment. Obviously, I mean, we all know that the Palouse was not a heavily forested uh, spot in, in most areas, and so uh, a railroad line like the Washington, Idaho, and Montana was pretty important in providing wood, uh, bring wood to Palouse that was then could be distributed throughout the county by some of the other lines so that there was the building material that farmers and city people needed. But the railroads themselves were major builders, uh, not just all the miles of track that they, they built, but because of the topography of the Palouse, they had to um, build more apparent structures, things like bridges and trestles, many of which, you know, or some of which still exist today. And I'll just show you a couple of my favorites uh, that still exist. This is a trestle over Altercott Road, which is uh, just north of Palouse, so it would have been on the Northern Pacific Line. Uh, this is a trestle that is uh, out at, uh, near the intersection of Parvin and Shawnee Roads, so it's a little southwest, a uh, little southeast of Colfax. And this is an old railroad bridge out at Elberton. Mm -hmm. But of course, the main and most interesting bridge of Whitman County uh, was, is that of the Manning Rye Bridge that was built uh, as part of that uh, Spokane Inland Empire electric line. And it was, when they built that line, uh, the branch line into Colfax, they had to cr cross the Palouse River three times. This, however, was not one of the original bridge because according to the Washington State uh, Bridge Inventory, it was not constructed until 1918, where the, the original uh, route was, was completed in, in 1907. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it was rebuilt and it's described as a wooden how truss bridge, a type of a bridge more common uh, in the east, especially in Pennsylvania, and uh, with its number, uh, the numerous covered bridges it has there. And while it's technically considered a covered bridge, actually only the trusses are, are boxed in. And this was because they needed to have clearance for the electric trains for all of that apparatus on the top of the train to go through. 
as I say, it, it was built in 1918. Uh, Shortly after that, the uh, I think Great Northern acquired the line and, and converted it to steam. Um, it was later taken over by the Northern Pacific, and which operated uh, it until uh, seven, uh, six, 67, just a year before I moved here. And then two years after that, it was bought by a, a family to, that took out the uh, rails and, and put in planks so they could use it as entrance to their property. But I was, one day I ran into a member of the a bridge crew and he was telling me that at one time the county had thought that they would buy the bridge and the property around it and make it into a park but decided that it was too uh, expensive. And it's very unfortunate because it's really uh, becoming very dilapidated today and I doubt it's, if it will exist too, too many more years. Uh, and it would, it's far too expensive now to consider rebuilding it or, or uh, that it would have been to maintain it all those years. So there are other railroad constructions that are also very significant but and, and fun to look at, but I'll touch on them a little bit later. What I want to do now is to talk about a kind of a combination impact of the built environment with farming practices in the Palouse, specifically with how farmers, uh, wheat farmers, got their crops to market. And I think many of you may know that before the railroads came in, grain had to be transported by wagon down to the Snake River. Uh, sent by barge down to the Pacific, around the tip of South America by boat up to the eastern uh, ports. And it was a, a, not only a very long journey, but especially down at the tip of, of South America, it was very dangerous. And because uh, they were afraid that if there was loose grain in the hold, uh, it would shift in the storms and it might make the, the boats might uh, capsize as a result. So. What this meant was that Whitman County farmers put their harvested grain into sacks that weighed about 130 pounds each, and then they were transported uh, by wagon down to the, to the river. And there were a couple of conveyance devices. Uh, tram, the interior tramway was the only one actually in Whitman County that also transported grain. But even after the railroads came in and uh, the technology uh, or boxcars were built that were really designed specifically for carrying um, bulk, uh, loose grain, uh, Whitman County farmers were uh, slow in, in moving to that process because as you can see, this was a 1911 uh, picture and they were still transporting things by uh, in sacks. Uh, one of the older, uh, first elevators in, in Whitman County. This is the Lonesome Pine, which is up on, uh, it was on the Milwaukee line, so it's west of, of Tico. Uh, it was built in 1914. And before that time, there was a flat house at the property that, that was used uh, when the line first was completed from 1809 on. And you can see uh, in the picture that you can see the remains of the flat house. It became so dilapidated that the family had it take, uh, taken down. They were afraid it was dangerous. But there is one um, spot in the county, and uh, maybe more, but one that I know of, where you can see both of these approaches to uh, holding grain to be prepared for shipping. And this is in Staley, which is just mm -hmm. southeast of, of Pullman. And uh, you can see the original flat house and then the elevator. And I love this because it also brings the whole process of, of shipping grain into the future because you have the metal storage units that are used today. Uh, there's no longer railroad through Staley and many of the farmers uh, take their, the wheat is taken in truck directly down to Almoda or perhaps to one of the rail lines where the uh, grain train comes through. But in many cases, they actually have local storage until they can get a feel on, get the best price for their wheat. I think where I'm going now. Oh, I, I know, what I wanted to say was if you remember that earlier picture about the, uh, with all of the grain stacked, uh, I think when you see these next two slides, 
you'll understand why Donald Manig says that the railroads changed the skyline of the Palouse. This is Cash Up uh, Elevator on off of Highway 195. And this is Revere, uh, mm -hmm. of, of Paul Revere fame, uh, out in the western part of the, of the county. I'm trying to think where, where I want to go now. Um, there was one impact that was totally unanticipated, uh, especially by the railroad folks, because if they had thought of it, it would have meant they envisioned their own demise. And I assume you, many of you will know what I'm talking about is the rails to trails movement. So this is an impact of the railroad that affects us even today. And in Whitman County, we're, we're really fortunate to have two uh, rails to trails. There's obviously the uh, Chipman Trail between Pullman and Moscow, uh, which we, I think, I've always thought it should be called the Chipman Mack Trail because of Nancy Mack's efforts on the part of the uh, Pullman Civic Trust and negotiating with the railroads. But and I'm not going to talk about it, uh, show pictures of it because all of you uh, have seen it almost weekly, daily on the on way between here and Palouse. But there also is the John Wayne Trail across the uh, upper part on the old Milwaukee line, which I, I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about. But there are two um, other areas I want to just mention. There's a small trail out of Colfax uh, that is on part of that old uh, electric line. And there's um, another trail, uh, I mean, a uh, proposed, and proposed may be too strong of a word, a hope for trail uh, on an old the rail line between Colfax and Palouse. And I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures because of, to give you some idea of the beauty of them. Um, this is the Colfax Trail. It's ideal if you have children, uh, grandchildren you want to take out because it's only about two and a half, three miles out and then comes back. But you're falling right along the Palouse and you can see the basalt hills um, in the background. Uh, it's especially lovely in, in the spring and late June, uh, late May and early June when the uh, fox comes out. And if you're birders, uh, every year during eagle nesting season, there's a pair of bald eagles that build a nest out there. I've, I've seen them every time I've gone that period of time. The other um, spot is the, uh, this rail is actually still owned by the Washington Department of Transportation. Uh, they, they acquired it because they didn't want to see the line um, uh, vacated because they hoped maybe that they could eventually replace have a, a train going on that line again but that hasn't happened and so it's kind of in limbo and the, again the uh, Pullman Civic Trust is kind of leading an effort to encourage people to think about having that made into another uh, rail to trail. And it's really a beautiful, it follows the Palouse River the whole way. And the track, of course, is still there. And this is one of the trestles. And that one I showed you earlier uh, at Parvin and Shawnee is also uh, one of the trestles along there. But the main, main uh, rail to trail that we have, the longest one in Whitman County, is the John Wayne Trail. It's no longer called that, but they've changed the name, but I will always revert, I you know, would have to think every time I said anything about you know, what is the current name. So I'm just going to call it the John Wayne Trail. And when I was exploring uh, the roads of Whitman County, um, I often would stop, I would see a trail and, and want to stretch my legs, and those are my dogs. And so I had actually been on many parts of the trail without realizing what it was. And it wasn't until one day I was driving and I saw this sign that uh, talked about the John Wayne uh, Wagons and Riders. Mm -hmm. And again, I Googled it to see what this organization was and found out that it is a, a group statewide of people, horse riders and teamsters, who once a year uh, like to, uh, they do the whole John Wayne, or the whole what's called the Iron Horse State Park Trail, all the way from west of the Cascades to Tico. And uh, 
So what I, I would really like to do to close out today, and this is going longer than I really intended, but I would like to uh, close out by giving those of you who might not have had the opportunity to either hike or bike or take a train on the old Milwaukee corridor, I'd like to take you across it and so you can see the beauty and what, what a wonderful uh, thing it is for Whitman County. We almost lost it a few years ago. Our own representatives uh, put in a bill that would have done away with uh, the section of the trail in Whitman County. Uh, but the Park Service decided that, you know, it would continue to support it. And, and, and there's hope that maybe there'll be more money available at some point in, in uh, the state that they'll be able to do some uh, uh, work on the trail because it's paved mainly uh, west of Vantage, but east of, of, of Vantage, it, it's not. But uh, a few, when I decided I wanted to, I got the idea to walk across the whole thing uh, and had some friends who agreed to go with me. Some of them are in the audience today. Uh, people who have done various sections. And so uh, please join us on our hike across northern Whitman County, or as I say, if you'd rather go by train, all aboard. Uh, the trail, I'm, and we're going to go west to east because that was the, the way that we did it. Let me, let me make one caveat. There is one spot, uh, uh, there are several places in the county where the county did not acquire the property and it's still argued by the uh, private landowners adjacent to it that it should have reverted to them. And there are even a couple of places where it's totally blocked off. And so private, you know, the rest of us can't walk. And one of those <coughs> spots, unfortunately, is the lower part of, of, of Rock Lake. And, uh, but we'll, we were able to see most of the Rock Lake area by going up through um, to hole in the ground. I don't know how many of you know that road and that spot, but I uh, could hike in from the east and, and go down to the part that was blocked off. But, uh, so it starts, as I say, out, out in the west, and I'm showing you this picture not because it's such a handsome group, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> because you'll see the sign, and this really indicates uh, the John Wayne Trail. You will see this at all of the various uh, sections of it. But the first part is all through the Scadland, uh, uh, the part of the uh, county, a part I really love. It kind of reminds me of the West Texas River and Cedar Breaks, but uh, really quite beautiful. Some t uh, if you go in early June, you may meet some of the John Wayne riders. Uh, they, they always uh, hit Whitman County about June and have their first encampment here. Uh, are the Teamsters. Uh, uh, these folks were on their way to the first encampment at Revere. Maybe you'll recognize mm -hmm. that uh, uh, the wonderful skyline changer. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they, they stop there for two or three days. They do some side trips. Their horses get taken care of. This was a horse called Diamond who was being attended to by a horse chiropractor. Uh, I never, never had heard of that. Uh, as we went east from uh, Revere, we're heading toward Rock Creek, and you can see the, the trestle, uh, Rock Creek trestle. We're nearing it. This picture is taken from on the trestle looking south, and you can see Rock Creek, which goes on and flows eventually down the uh, Whitman County, Adam, Adams County <coughs> line, eventually into the Clueless River. And uh, this was all, a lot of the uh, Escure Ranch or the uh, Rock Creek Management area is out there. Some of you may be familiar with that. And it was, it was all sheep country at one point. Mm. And if you look north from the trestle, this is Rock Creek Falls, one of seven uh, falls in Whitman County, which I was amazed to discover. And this is another picture of the trestle. This trestle uh, was built in 1908, <laughs> Scotty climbed down under it to see the date on it, and John remembered the date <laughs> because it was six years ago or five years ago, so he went. But as John pointed out to me, when the Milwaukee was built, it was typical for railroads to first build the trestles and the uh, 
the big structures and then lay the track, complete the track between them. So uh, at this point, we're going to, you know, turn up toward uh, Rock Lake. And this is one of the more unusual barriers that has been put along the trail. Uh, most people were just content to put up a wire fence, but uh, this person was pretty emphatic about not wanting trespassers. But then when, if you go back, beyond that we went down to that and then started back and this is a picture of rock lake and some of you will recognize nancy mack we were having our lunch break and it's probably a good time for us to take a quick break uh, so you can get a little you know rest a little before we do the rest of the county because i want to take this opportunity to share with you a railroad related story uh, of rock lake i don't know i if you know what you know about Rock Lake, but it's the largest lake in, in totally in Whitman County. It's very deep, very cold, and can be very dangerous because of its size. Storms can literally come up. And over the years, there have been many deaths on the lake. Um, the Indian, Native American people uh, had many legends about it, everything from, you know, a, a sea monster that ate the bodies and that's why you know they were never able to be recovered but the story I want to share was one I heard when I first came to Pullman and was working for public assistance and had a couple of clients up in the area this de uh, delightful older gentleman I'm using older instead of elderly because he was probably younger than I am now <laughs> uh, he was convinced that, well, first of all, he told me that there'd been a major train derailment on, along that part, the east side of Rock Lake. But he was convinced that because of the coldness of the lake, if those cars could be salvaged and brought up, the contents would be in perfect condition, wouldn't have been rusted, and the contents were Model T Fords. <laughs> and so all one had to do was to get enough money to do the salvage operation and you would be a millionaire, billionaire. Um, unfortunately, I, I learned a, a, a rather unhappy ending to that story because when I was driving around interviewing, talking with people, I was interviewing a family uh, uh, from that area and just as I was leaving, facetiously said something about, well, when are you going to amount a salvage operation and bring up all those Model T's and become rich? And uh, they told me that one of their nephews had drowned in an accident on the lake about a couple years before that. And the family wanting to recover the body had hired a art, state of the art salvage company from Seattle area they came and they explored, uh, dive all along that eastern side of the mm -hmm. lake and, and were able to recover his body, but they also proved that there are no railroad cars in the bottom <laughs> <of that>. <laughs> <laughs> So let's, uh, let's move on now. And uh, this is one of the uh, tunnels that the uh, Milwaukee had to build along uh, that side of the lake. It has caved in, so you can't go through it. You have to go around. But uh, something I noticed, not at the time, but I'd taken the picture and even zoomed in on the carving up over the, you know, over the tunnel, and I thought, well, here's Chicago, Milwaukee, and P.S. St. Paul. St. Paul. P.S. P.S. St. Paul and Pacific. S.P. S.P. is St. Paul. St. Paul. This is P.S. So hmm. here's a mystery. Was the carver did just make a major <laughs> mistake? <laughs> My theory is that these were again far-sighted uh, railroad company. Mm -hmm. They were thinking ahead to their ultimate destination, Puget Sound. It's <laughs> 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 as good as any. You know, make up stories if you don't know. So, um, there also are a couple of wonderful trestles uh, along that side of the lake. I don't know if the, any of these are the original trestles. I, I, I rather doubt this one doesn't look because this was one of the original, original ones and you can see there's quite a bit of difference. And this is uh, from the end of Rock Lake and at this point uh, we pick up the trail along the Pine Creek. This is from, as we're coming down pretty high, you can see Pine Creek down uh, and the trail eventually goes down closer 
and right uh, there's this a rather long tunnel that we were it is still open that we could go through and then as you get very close to Holland uh, the ground road there was a derailment but uh, there were no tin lessees around but um, then crossing over a hole in the ground um, following the Long Pine Creek again really beautiful area and spring wildflowers you can see this gives you a real feel of what the trail is like most of the uh, in Whitman County most of it's pretty flat and 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 fairly good footing. Um, there, as you go further east, there's more farmland, and occasionally you run across a, a local inhabitant who doesn't want you on their trail. Uh, this was one of the nicer ones we met. Uh, actually, he was just he was just making sure mom and the, and the little chicks about this big got out of the way before we went through. Uh, but one of the complaints of, of local land uh, owners has been about trash. And I really saw very little littering along anywhere along the trail, unless, uh, no more than you might see along a county road, you know, occasional beer can, mainly of shotgun shells. So, and so that was not necessarily hikers. But near uh, Malden, we did see this lovely sight. But again, you know, I, I, when I testified up in Tico in support of, of the John Wayne Trail, I said I'd never seen a hiker with a microwave under, you know, in their backpack or under their arm. <laughs> and I think this has just been dumped by, you know, people who, there is a road that gives access to the trail and they could use it as a dumping place. And that brings us to Malden. Here's, this is the old roundhouse at Malden. Um, and I included it because there's virtually nothing there today. We did see a couple of uh, <coughs> structures, not even sure you know, what they were, or what role they played, if any, in the rail yard. Uh, and then this is, this is the section where we're actually going far in Pine Creek up into Spokane County and back down, but eventually uh, wind, oops, wind up in the uh, more open country uh, around Rosalia. And this, uh, along with Banning Road, is my favorite construction in Whitman County. I just have always thought from the time I moved here, the first time I drove to Spokane, I thought it was truly a beautiful, beautiful thing. Again, it was not the original trestle. Uh, oops, went the wrong way. This was one of the original trestles. And um, these old wooden trestles, usually they were filled in with dirt and rocks to strengthen them. And this one couldn't because it went over, the, the Milwaukee loved to go over other railroads. Uh, anyway, two other railroads and a county road, and it did collapse a couple of years after it was, or a few years after it was built. And again, according to the uh, 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 inventory, the state bridge inventory, uh, it describes it as a reinforced concrete arch viaduct which was completed in 1915. So that the collapse of the first one happened sometime between 1909 and 1915. But the inventory also included an article from a contemporary uh, railroad gazette, uh, which I love because uh, it, they quoted it, the concrete design was selected for the permanent structure because the site was one where conditions of appearance had to be taken somewhat into account, <laughs> as the structure could be seen from the two other railroads and a county highway. <laughs> the Milwaukee knew what they were doing. There's supposed to be uh, one of the workers buried in that one. I, I don't know. Yeah, I, a, when I was little, that was a yeah. I, I, you know, I, I have no doubt that there, there were many stories like that, because it was certainly not building these things was not an easy job. Anyway, this uh, then was a, a, a picture of <coughs> it when it was built before. There was, this structure was also, uh, when the Milwaukee went bankrupt in what, the 1880, uh, 1980s, uh, I was told, uh, and well, the inventory says that it was under threat of demolition, that a salvage company had put a bid in on it. Fortunately, that didn't occur, and it's now part of you know the John Wayne Trail, and you can walk across it as we were doing at this point. Going into the last leg of, of, of our hike, which is in the easternmost part of the county, um, you're coming out under Highway 195, 
and you can see the Pine Creek again and more farmland. There uh, used to be trestles over a number of the roads, but most of them have been taken down now, and so you have to go, uh, the, the trail is kind of on a, an embankment, and you have to go down off the road, cross, uh, off the trail, cross the road, and back up the other side. There, uh, there is one trestle left, and I should have taken, a, a shown you a picture of the whole one, but this was one of my art photos I had. <laughs> <laughs> And then um, we leave Pine Creek and head more due west, uh, east, and this is our friend Lone Pine Elevator once again. Uh, we're uh, going behind. And then the last of the hike, uh, this uh, part was a little blown up, but eventually you can see the trestle at Tico. Uh, you no longer can walk across it, uh, at least not now. There is an organization in Tico, Friends of the Tico Trestle, that they're always willing to take money if anyone wants to support them, but they're uh, applying for grants and they hope to eventually repair it so it, it can be actually a part of the trail that's walked. And, and then we end up, uh, after our long, long hike, uh, contributing to the local economy of Chico, uh, which I, I think is very important and it's one of the arguments for the Rails and Trails. Um, let me use this opportunity while we're waiting for our uh, orders to come to uh, for the end of, uh, tell you a story at the end of the Milwaukee Road and not just the end of the county road, uh, county roads, but uh, another of the stories I learned, uh, heard from my public assistance clients when I first was here. And there was this, again, older gentleman in Tico who, I can't remember his name, but all of the caseworkers called him the hobo poet. And um, he had come from the eastern side of the US. He had been active in the labor movement, had voted for Eugene Debs. Um, but either was, uh, you know, lost his job, needed, to, was coming west looking for work. And since there weren't immigrant trains in those, at that point in time, uh, he, Jump, you know, came by boxcar and, and was a, a hobo along the rail. Uh, he, I'm sure, I think the crews of, of, of uh, trains probably at that point in time were, were sympathetic to the vagrants, the people who were just looking for work. And while they might not invite them to sit in the boxcar, uh, he was able to chat with the crews and he would even ask their advice on where he might break his trip for the day. Was there a small town that would be more amenable to having you know, a hobo spending the night there? And uh, he would usually get you know, some information and ask them a little bit about the town. And then during the day while he was riding the rails, he would write a poem about it. So at the end of the day when he got off the train, he would go to the local, if there was a local paper, or he might go to a local cafe and tell the folks that I've been stopping in your town. I'm really impressed and so impressed that I've written a poem about it. <laughs> and uh, he said invariably he got a free meal out of it, sometimes a, a place to stay for the night. Um, how he ended up in Chico, why he decided to end his trip west there, I, I don't know. Uh, he never uh, would say. My idea is maybe he just ran out of points. Because <laughs> <laughs> as, as I have run out of stories. Thank you for your patience. It went longer than I was <laughs> Seattle, I took the North Coast train because my time was limited. I wish some time to gain. I crossed the Great Columbia where roses were in bud, then wandered into dinner and there met Dr. Spud. Was lying in a platter, sure something just immense, served with a spoon and butter, and it only cost ten cents. It was split right up the center, filled with butter, and what's better, it was sweet and hot and meaty. Was it good? Well, I should stutter. Oh, you great.
great big baked potato. You are Irish through and through. You may talk of your onions, your garlic or stew, but just try that potato. It's good for you. If you want a sure thing hunch for your breakfast, dinner, or lunch, on the NPRR in the dining car, get a great big baked potato. I looked at it and smelled of it, twas sweet as any rose. I thought if I consumed it, I must loosen up my clothes. But the great big baked potato soon was lodged in my inside, and I was glad and happy on the NP road to ride. But I've been busy thinking and wondering ever since how the great big baked potato could be furnished for ten cents. Of course, I ordered other things and on them I did dine. But I cannot forget that lovely spot. It was oh so very fine. Oh, you great big baked potato. You are Irish through and through. You may talk of your onions, your garlic or stew, but just try that potato. It's good for you. If you want a sure thing hunch for your breakfast, dinner or lunch, on the NPRR in the dining car, get a great big baked potato. Sure does the things that makes a service best. I always try to ride with them when traveling in the West. Their milk and cream and vegetables are always nice and fresh. Of course, their stuff is raised upon their farm at paradise. Then here's to the NP road, road Dr. Spud and the man who makes you travel happily and does whatever he can. To serve you well and promptly, all regardless of expense, a great big baked potato that only costs ten cents. Oh, you great big baked potato, you are Irish through and through. You may talk of your onions, your garlic or stew, but just try that potato. It's good for you. If you want a sure thing hunch for your breakfast, dinner or lunch, on the NPRR in the dining car, get a great big baked potato.